Please welcome Mr. David Bennett, DISA Chief Information Officer and Director, Computing Services. Uh, so what I want to do today, I'm Dave Bennett. Uh, pick a title. Uh, I'm the Principal Director now of Enterprise Services. I'm also the Chief Information Officer for the agency. Uh, so what I want to do today is talk to you for the 30 minutes I've got. You're going to have a hard time getting my picture because I'm not going to stand still long. Uh, but I want to talk to you about where we're going. Okay. Uh, a couple of months ago, the boss pulled me in. He says, Dave, I want you to go over and, uh, and take over Enterprise Services because we want Alfred to do some other stuff. And I said, okay, so who's going to be the CIO? He said, you are. And I said, thank you, I think. Uh, but i got to give the man credit. He obviously had a better site picture than I did because I was trying to figure out what's the linkage between CIO and ESD. And uh, bottom line is I think he's ahead of his time in thinking and everything because I'm just now, two months later, starting to get a glimpse of where his mind was. And I'll have to tell you, it's a uh, very interesting perspective, and I think it's the right perspective. So. Uh, let me have the next slide, please. So think of it as an expanding focus. We're converging, hopefully you can see my pointer, multiple missions. As a CIO, I deliver IT to the agency globally. All right. So I am a provider of capability, and I am also a consumer of capability from an agency perspective. Now then. Under the ESD hat, I am a provider of capability from the enterprise level. So left brain, I provide enterprise services, hosting of capability, etc. Right brain, I'm going to consume the same capabilities that I'm providing over here. So when you talk about speed of delivery or working through the technical implications of delivering a capability from an enterprise level, what's one of the things you always worry about? How am I going to deliver the capability at the seams, i.e. the post camp and station, and how is it going to be used at the desktop? Now we have in one organization within the agency the ability to look at things from the data center to the desktop. So as we talk about enterprise email, as a CIO, I'm your test case. How well are we delivering the capability? Are we working through the issues? How do we test it out real world? to make sure at the seams and at the desktop it's going to work as we expect while I'm over here on the other hand developing the capability and working through the details of how do I provide the capability from the cloud down at the end user's experience level. We've not been able to do that before and now we have that capability, that visual, that, that reaction, that feedback mechanism in one organization. So lots of synergy there that we didn't have before, not to say it wasn't working before, but now you have it all sort of working together inside of one organization against one set of priorities and direction. And so as you see at the bottom of the slide here, that's really the scope of the activities, big picture view, if you will, of that whole trade space. So I have all 12 data centers in DOD uh, at the enterprise level. We also provide, we do development of enterprise services on behalf of the department. Enterprise email is one case. We host capability for the services. We also provide the desktop to the 12,000 DISA users globally. So a pretty wide swath, if you will, of IT capability delivery responsibility going forward. Next slide. So as we talk about providing sort of this services cloud, if you will, we have a variety of activities that are underway that you can bend in a variety of ways. And this is just the way we chose to bend it for this presentation. Uh, but it's a good way to understand. So what are some of the things that we are doing from a layer perspective, if you will, whether you're talking about at the very base infrastructure layer or you're moving all the way up to the software services layer? The key thing is that we are looking at delivering these capabilities and these services. I don't know if you can see, yeah. see the services and everything here. 
from a standpoint of an integrated stack, an integrated set of capabilities that build upon each other and tie in what we're doing from a mission assurance perspective because you got to be able to defend the capability, you got to be able to monitor and understand what's happening in your environment, as well as how do you provide that service management piece of the puzzle? How do you work the trouble tickets? How do you react to the end users, et cetera, when they have a, a, an issue as you go forward? So what you see is the check blocks uh, on the slide are really some of those early products that we have been putting in place over the last few years to give us enterprise capability delivered from the enterprise level from the computing cloud, if you will. Now, I'm not a, I'm not a big cloud guy because I'm not sure what I I, that I understand what cloud means. But the reality is, you know, we're providing capability from an enterprise perspective. Coin it how you want to. But the reality is, you as the consumer don't need to know where the capability is housed. You could care less. We just got to make sure at the point of use the capability is, is consistent, it's reliable, it works as expected, and it's performant. And so as we deliver these capabilities, that really is the goal that we have in mind. So whether we're talking about physical resources in terms of what we're doing in the decks to ensure that the capability, the facilities, the infrastructure that, uh, that the computing environments are leveraging, that you have full redundancy there, that you have capacity in terms of computing capacity, storage capacity, electricity, HVAC, floor space, et cetera, et cetera, and built-in redundancy so you don't go down. We're already working that. We already have that in place and we're continuing to expand on that. We have some things that we have not completed yet. BDI, wireless LAN is just a couple of examples. And as you go up through the stack, you see some of those things that we're doing and that we still have work to be done on. Next slide. Now I'm going to run through these slides relatively quickly, so I give you guys, ladies, guys is gender neutral, uh, opportunity to ask questions or you get five more minutes downstairs in the break room. Uh, here's just a different pictorial, if you will, because the reality is, because we are providing from the enterprise level all the way down to the desktop, the end point that we really try to keep in mind is on the left-hand side of the screen. And that is, what is that end user device that we have to deliver capability to? And we've got to be able to do it to any device, any location at any time. And do it consistently, do it in a way that it doesn't turn the users off, that they want to go somewhere else, do something else. And so that's sort of the objective target that we're shooting for as we deliver capabilities. And what we've got on the chart here is really sort of a binning function to try and understand what are the piece parts that we're doing because you can't just do one piece of it. If you really want to make sure that you're hitting the end user with what he needs, when he needs it, and where he needs it, you got to make sure you're providing all the components in between that give you the ability to do that. And you have to do it in a way that's consistent and that the DOD at large can leverage to help DOD reduce cost. So I have, again, I have to look at it from two perspectives. Number one, as an end user, as a CIO, I'm consuming all this stuff. So I don't have to use my budget to build it. I'm paying the other side of my brain to deliver this capability to me so I don't have to invest resources to build it. Now, so when it talks to hosting capability, and you can't really see my pointer very well, but any time as a CIO, I'm providing capability that I have to create that's specific to the agency, I don't want to go out and buy the hardware because then I've got to have a sustainment tail associated with it. It's a whole lot easier for me to put it into a deck and use capacity services for storage, for processing, for communications, et cetera, so that I don't have to worry about that sustainment tail. I just pay the deck basically an annual cost to provide me the service. Same thing as we look at 
the machine facing services, the infrastructure sort of things, a directory service. I don't have to worry about providing a directory service to DISA because I consume the enterprise directory service that the DEX, the ESD side of my hat, provides to the department. So we really have the ability to look at it from two ways and make sure as we're developing these capabilities, we understand how they're going to be consumed. And it makes things a lot simpler as we try to figure out how to do it. We already understand what the end user environment is going to look like because this is a fairly representative environment of what DOD looks like, just not necessarily at the scale, but we literally have, I provide IT globally as a CIO. Pick a region and I've got some IT in there that I'm going to consume from a deck. So I'm just like the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, et cetera, from that perspective. So I'm leveraging identity and access management. I'm leveraging the data services piece. Okay, for big data, on for folks like Mark Orndorff, who's going to talk to you later on from his mission assurance perspective. I'm also, and this the user-facing piece is the piece that, as a DISA employee, you see most readily. Everything else is sort of hidden, but that's the piece you really see. That's the piece you get graded on. And so I don't want to invest a lot of resources from a CIO side, so I'm going to consume the enterprise solution. The more I can consume, the less I have to pay to create and sustain going forward. And so as the enterprise decides to change, I change with the enterprise and I'm not wedded to old technology. So on one side I want to consume and sort of motivate the other side to keep technology current and be looking for the next capability so I can consume it over here. And as a provider of it, I'm over here going, okay. How are you using it? How do I make sure I'm going to provide it to you in a way that you can consume it easily? Next slide. Uh, so what does this mean from a JIE perspective? Because everybody's heard JIE mentioned several times throughout the, the day, I would assume. Uh, JIE, from my perspective, really is more of a impact on the enterprise computing centers than my CIO hat in particular. And so one of the things that we're doing relative to JIE is uh, Ms. Takai signed out a memo last month, uh, late July, that basically defined and declared that all of the core data centers for JIE were going to be DISA decks. So the DISA Enterprise Computing Centers are the core data centers for JIE. Now what that means is that that becomes the target audience, if you will, or the target computing environment that will provide the enterprise computing capability for the department worldwide. In addition to that, it is also a key part of the Federal Data Center or uh, Computing Center Consolidation Initiative where the services are being driven to reduce slash eliminate their data centers and move them into the core data centers. So there is a big effort underway right now to look at all the computing that is out there in the services and if it is a local computing requirement, a local application that is used basically on the installation and not used externally, it would go into what's called a installation processing node, small capability with, with certain limitations. Other than that, the applications that are used broadly or outside the installation, they're moving to a core data center and that is to be done by FY18. So that is a huge center of gravity for the department in terms of where computing is going. What that gets you is the ability to manage and drive standardization within the department in those data centers. You can drive 
what the virtual operating environments are going to look like. You can drive what the security architecture is going to look like. You can drive what the communications infrastructure is going to look like. You can drive all of these aspects in a standard way so as an application developer, you don't have to guess what the world's going to look like. You get it hosted in a CDC, you're going to know what your bandwidth is going to look like. You're going to know what security architecture is going to look like. You're going to understand these things. And as we drive more and more to virtualized uh, environments, which is the goal, is to maximize VOEs, your rates will go down. And then we have, through the ability to leverage the contracts, we've got the capacity services contracts in place, we have the ability to scale up or scale down as the requirement drives us. So if you have a capability in the environment today that is supporting, let's just say, 10,000 users, and tomorrow it needs to support 50,000 users, we can very quickly turn up additional VOEs, additional storage in the SANs, communications, et cetera, to scale as you need it. And as the demand goes away, potentially if it does, we can scale that back down. And as the end user or the program manager, they don't have to worry about buying boxes that are going to sit there on the floor unused. You scale, you ebb and flow with the demand cycle. That's the real, in my mind, the real value of the core data centers. Consolidation, standardization, and the ability to ebb and flow as the demand drives you. And when you can do that, you can start driving your price structures down to a point where it makes it extremely affordable to the end users. Now, as we talk about commercial cloud capabilities, et cetera, CDCs will be, a, will be tied into that commercial cloud strategy going forward. All right, next slide. So what are we doing relative to the CDCs to ensure we hit that, uh, that requirement? I'll just tell you, in the two months I've been out looking and stuff, I'm amazed at all the stuff that's going on. Capacity services is key. We have contracts, capacity services and contracts for storage, for processing, for communications, et cetera, that give us that ability to ebb and flow the software, or ebb and flow the processing, ebb and flow the storage, ebb and flow the communications, so that I don't have to invest in buying boxes to sit on a floor. The contract provides it, I just tell the provider, fire up some more boxes or scale it down. And then I don't have to worry about how do I sustain that capability long term. Okay, so that, in my mind, is a key piece, and as Part of that process, when we, when we move along those lines, we can start to standardize on a lot of the infrastructure things within the computing center that tend to drive cost. Because at the end of the day, floor space is critical. So anything we can do to reduce the demand for floor space, i.e. put more capability in smaller boxes, that means I can put more boxes on the same floor. The less wiring I have within a particular rack means I can start saving on that cost. Everything is going towards shrinking the footprint so I can put more capability within the same footprint. The more I can do that, the more I can drive prices down. Network bandwidth, 48, I want to make sure I get it right, 48 gigs at the rack to 128 gigs at the rack. We're basically making the CDCs the center of gravity from a processing perspective and a communications perspective. So you won't be constrained from a bandwidth perspective as to whether or not I can handle the load of users coming in and out. We'll take email as an example today. We got a million and a half people using enterprise email today. I would say by and large, I never want to be absolute, but by and large, Performance-wise, I can't tell that that capability is not sitting right there on my desktop. And I have no, I do know, but 
for the sake of this discussion, I've got no idea where the capability is being served up out of. Doing these uh, upgrades to the facilities just ensures that as we go down the path to bring in more capabilities and uh, move to new capabilities, we have the infrastructure in place that allows us to bring that capability in in a seamless way. Storage, uh, capa storage capacity services is critical because you never have enough storage. Right? You never have enough storage. We have to be able to bring that up and bring it down as demand requires. So everything we can do to maximize that is, is critical. All right, I won't, uh, I've already talked about the value added. Uh, tier three, uh, the tag light on the bottom there, tier three compliant for all the CDCs. What that really means from an end user perspective is we're investing huge amounts of money in these data centers to ensure we have full redundancy throughout those data centers, whether we're talking power, HVAC, uh, floor space, racks, overhead trays, uh, dual power paths, redundant communications off of different, uh, different nodes on the installation, separate power feeds. I mean, it is a uh, highly fault tolerant environment and we're doing that as we go forward and that's been a massive undertaking and it is still going on. Uh, so that really is the standard to be a core data center and we'll continue to improve that over time. Next slide. So, I want to talk about a couple of things that we're doing from a contract opportunities perspective. Uh, I've already been kind of given a heads up that everybody had a lot of concern slash question about the storage capacity services uh, because there was some uh, Fed biz ops went up and it went down about <laughs> that particular contract. But I'm here to tell you, yes, we are doing a ESS2, and details are as you see here. We intend to, re to release the RFP fourth quarter of this FY with the expectation of awarding, I'll just say pretty much at the end of the first quarter 14. Okay, and that, that deals with the storage capacity service, capacity storage capability within all of the enterprise computing centers. GCDS, uh, Global Content Delivery System, that is a capability that we have in place today that basically provides us the ability to stream globally uh, both video as well as data to basically all over the globe, okay? We're recompeting that contract, we're doing a single award, and expectation is we'll make award in the second quarter of 14. The last two are really with my CIO hat on. Uh, virtual desktop infrastructure. We are in the process right now as we speak, getting ready to kick off a VDI proof of concept within the agency based on agency demands. We've spent a month of collecting every ounce of data from over 12,000 desktops scattered globally across the agency to see what their use patterns are, what the demands are for capability, what's the performance of those capabilities, et cetera, over a one month time frame. The intent would be to use that information to determine what does that computing need look like from an end user's perspective based on the agency's accumulated set of data. VDI basically will allow me to take that data and move all of the computing capability to the back end and get it off the desktop. When I can do that, I can very quickly move more to thin clients, zero state clients, mobile platforms, et cetera, and save huge amounts of money. VDI, in my opinion, is a huge game changer from an agency perspective because it allows me lots of opportunities to do new and innovative things from how quickly I can turn up a capability 
to how I can manage security in the network. So now I no longer have to worry about what's the security end state on a desktop sitting on somebody's desk because all they're getting is a presentation layer. They're not getting all of the application activity in the, uh, that's on the desktop today. So they, in my mind, VDI is a huge game changer. The last one is wireless uh, LAN. Uh, you go, well, wireless has been out there for a while. Why, why is that important? So this is what I'm intending to do. We've already done the proof of concept, is to put in place a wireless LAN capability across the Fort Meade campus. In, and this is a secret open storage environment in every location except for SCIF space so that we can access the DISANET wherever we are within the facility. Again, going back to what you've heard earlier today, the ability to do work in a mobile fashion. So if I need to move my desktop around with me throughout the building to do that, the wireless LAN will give me that capability. Now, <clears throat> while I did caveat it to say this is a Fort Meade instantiation. The intent would be this would become the blueprint to include the CONOPS, the TTPs, the architectural design, et cetera, that as a CIO, I push out broadly across the agency and tell wherever you're at as a DISA site, if you have the ability to provide wireless capability in your facility, here's how you will do it. You will implement it this way, et cetera, so that you could access the DISA network from a wireless capability. So uh, while we're focused on Fort Meade with this contract, the real key is longer term, it becomes the blueprint for greater application across the department, at least from a DISA perspective. Okay. Uh, that's my last slide. I don't see any signs in the back say I'm running late. Uh, it's the old army adage, sit down, shut up, eat up, and get up. So questions? OK, I don't, uh, somebody's supposed to be holding a paddle in us. Becky, here comes Becky. Now don't ask hard questions. Yes, sir. Uh, Al Stewart, uh, DKW Communications. Uh, the core data center memo um, certainly get a lot of attention, I'm sure. Um, impact on Spayworth's decision to consolidate into New Orleans, Charleston, and San Diego. Okay. Sorry. No, that's not a hard question. You may not like my answer. Uh, so the memo, have you, have you seen the memo? Okay. So the interesting thing about the memo is it says, if you're a core data center, you are in DISA. DISA owns the core data centers. Today, it equates to these sites. There will be an annual review of computing requirements that says if the demand for core capability expands beyond this initial set of sites, then there will be sort of a runoff that says where do we want to add an additional core data center. The memo says if a site is chosen, that core data center becomes a DISA asset. The point being is DISA, per the memo, is the only provider of core data centers. All right. Now, the question is going to be as we go forward, what does the service, what's the service component plans to migrate their data either into installation processing nodes which is supposed to be constrained to local installation use. And if it doesn't meet that criteria, there should be a plan for moving that capability into a core data center. So per the memo, there, it's, there's not a lot of wiggle room as to what that game plan is. It is really driving the services to create a strategy for how they intend to comply with the direction. So each service is probably looking at that slightly differently and thinking through how they're going to execute that, SPA war being no different from the Air Force. 
component or combatant commands have the same concern. And I was in a conference call this week with Transcom about that very same thing from a GAE perspective and CDCs. How are they, how and where are they moving their IT, their hosting of their IT, et cetera. And so uh, there's a lot of folks working through the thought process right now of what does it mean to us, how we're gonna do it, et cetera. And I'll be honest with you, we internally are working through the mechanics of it as well to uh, uh, figure out how we can be more effective and efficient in terms of bringing in capability and do it at a uh, uh, lower cost, if you will. I, next question, John McMonagle. John McMonagle from Verizon. This has to do with the core data centers as well. As DISA moves forward regarding the infrastructure as a service and selects the awardees for that, would those commercial centers also be construed under, under, as a core data center? So as we talk about infrastructure as a service, uh, so we internally are, are also providing infrastructure as a service. Uh, as we go to cloud and we look at commercial opportunities to leverage commercial clouds, et cetera, you really start to get into the discussion about uh, where's the risk. The bottom line is we're looking at risk from two perspectives. Uh, what is the information that is publicly releasable it's not PII in nature, that it's very low risk, that uh, if it gets out into the public, we're really not that concerned about. That type of information, we could very easily push into a commercial cloud, and that does not have to be in a core data center. Okay. okay? Higher risk beyond that publicly releasable information, uh, we're working through the strategy on how we're gonna execute that scenario but one of, the, uh, one of the options under consideration would be leverage commercial cloud capability, but do it within a core data center. Thank okay. you. Alfred, I get that right? Okay. Jerry. Yeah, Dave, thank you. A uh, couple of things uh, sitting here thinking. You mentioned a uh, memo that Mr. Kai signed out relative to CONUS. What is going on with the no, OCONUS? No, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what is going on with the OCONUS data centers? And also, is there discussion between DOD and the IC relative to co locating some of the data that they're using? Okay. Uh, so, real good question. So, CDC and JIE are not necessarily synonymous, there is an intersection between the two activities. Uh, so, the CDC memo that Mr. Kai signed out is, as you correctly said, is CONUS focused. The OCONUS CDC sites have not been identified yet, okay? Uh, but our expectation is we will be at least part of what that OCONUS world would look like. Uh, but we are working through the details, et cetera, of what does that mean? So from a GIE perspective, uh, we already have capability in both UCOM, PACOM, et cetera. Uh, and as we go forward, we're just, we're working through and with them to figure out what's that OCONUS answer so that what we do in those spaces is in sync with where we're going from a JIE perspective, okay? Is that, does that answer? So the IC, so truth be told, we already host IC data. We don't do all of it, but we do host a fair amount of IC data today. Uh, so if a decision were made that said I see more IC data needs to go into the CDC, we would take a look at that and, and work it from there. But I'm not aware of any mandate or anything that, that's driving them to the CDC scenario right now. Mr. Bennett, we have a virtual question. What is DISA doing to reduce the turnaround time on service request forms? Oh, I was waiting on that one. The reality is we've got to figure out how to do it. Uh, especially with the mandates tied to CDC and the migration of capabilities into the core data centers, we got to do it in a way that's efficient, effective, and quick. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to handle the load that's going to be put on us, whether you're talking FY18 or FY28. 
uh, we've got to get better at it. There is no magic pill that gets you there because everybody's coming to the game with a different level of maturity in their capability. If you start from scratch and you're developing a new capability, we could put you into a virtualized environment almost overnight. Okay? If you're coming to us with the capability that's been out there, an old COBOL program that hadn't really changed since 1903, the reality is we're going to have to look at that and figure out how it's designed, what's that, what's that infrastructure got to look like to support it, what are all those variables. And it's, it's those things that really drive the time frame required to provide an LE to the customer. It is those unique aspects of a capability. The more you meet, and this goes back to the point I made earlier about the CDCs being standardized. When you get to a standardized architecture and standardized implementation, standard, standardized way of doing business, if you come to me and say, I want to do something, I can very cleanly tell you, here, this is all we got to do, boom. You can have an LE in you know, 24 hours, 48 hours, and, and we can automate a huge portion of that provision those boxes and you're up and running. It's when people come in with all the cats and the dogs that in all those unique aspects of I'm special, I'm different, I gotta have this, I gotta have that, that requires us to go in and sort of do that analysis of what is it you're trying to do, what's your expectations, what's your uh, service level requirements, what are all these unique pieces because you're unique that force us to go in and do that in-depth analysis and engineering uh, deconstruction of your capability to figure out what it is you're trying to accomplish so that we can meet your intent. So, there's, like I said, there's no magic bullet. I do agree we've got to resolve and get faster at providing uh, responses to the customer in terms of the SRFs and the LEs. Uh, but it's, it's going to take some effort. Uh, we have started it. We met yesterday, uh, heard of us, to start working through the details of, of how we would get there. So I, apart from that tap dance, and I don't have a, a real good, you know, do X, Y, Z right now and, and answer it. But I recognize that that is a huge, one of the huge things that we have got to improve on. We've got a question over in the corner. How am I doing on time? Sir, you've got about five minutes left, okay. and we also have uh, some virtual questions. Perhaps I'll ask you one while we walk the microphone over there. Okay. Oh, we, we already got, we're already He's already there. there. All right. Sir, James Cloninger from CINCAD. Um, you talked about installation processing nodes, and, and uh, the question is, uh, how do you justify that versus using the DISA deck? Um, my, my scenario is in the Army with uh, geospatial data and local requirements like E911 used by first responders and that kind of thing at the installation. Is there a uh, justification mechanism for that kind yes. of thing? Yes. So, uh, again, another left brain, right brain scenario. So I have the decks, right? I also have over here on the third floor, and the fourth floor, and the fifth floor, computing rooms. So I'm also going to be the IPN for Fort Meade, or at least that's the recommendation to the Army right now, is that DISA has the DECs, and DISA are the CDCs, and DISA is also the IPN for Fort Meade. So an IPN is really supporting the installation requirements, and so the E911 and other things that are specific to the installation would stay resident at the installation. It's where you get into the question mark about do I, do I have an IPN or do I move the capability into a CDC, it really becomes a question of how globally is the information used or the application. So it, there's no way I could pass the test to say uh, we're going to put our time and attendance capability in my comp IPN here in the building if that capability is going to be used in PACOM. Okay? That, that doesn't pass the test because you're really now going to the enterprise as opposed to just staying at the installation. 
So I, there are, there will be checks and balances to, to work through those particular issues. But the IPN really is there to make sure that there's a recognized need that there's computing requirements at the installation level. Yes, sir. Mr. Bennett, as part of the VDI strategy, are you looking at thin clients and zero-based clients as these could be easily tied to the cloud? Yes. Next question. <laughs> no, so, so uh, short answer is yes, but here's my issue for, for you thin client providers. If you, you've got to be able to push a video signal. If you are providing a thin client device and that DTU cannot consume a video signal from a camera and push it back into the infrastructure, then my personal opinion, I don't have any use for it, okay? Uh, so as we get more and more into UC, so DCO is a huge aspect. I mean, I, that's one of my bigger headaches. Not DCO itself, but the fact that in DCO, the huge value of DCO is being able to see the other side. It is that face-to-face -face interaction, to be able to view the slides, to be able to view the people, et cetera. Well, if you're on a thin client and you can't push the video from your side, then I'm not sure what that does for me. It's no different from a telephone at that point. So as we go forward and UC becomes more and more integrated into how we do business, people, want, once you start using it, People will want to see the other end of the communication. We've seen this time and time again, especially through the furlough period where more and more interaction is taking place remotely as opposed to face-to-face -face meetings. Okay, next question. Sir, this will be your last question. Okay. Uh, Sterling Large, Lockheed Martin. Question, in looking forward at your upcoming acquisitions and your strategies, are you going to start to incorporate pre-solicitation conferences, draft documentation, or are you going to be going from RFI to final RFP direct? So we're looking broadly across all of those things. So from the cloud service provider uh, scenario, we just had a pre-solicitation conference here uh, over in Columbia, Maryland three weeks ago. To, to get two weeks ago? Four weeks ago. It's not our fault. Okay, uh, but, but the point is, we're look, we're, we, we want to use that, we want to use draft RFPs, we want to use RFIs, because let's face it, we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. You guys are the ones that have the good ideas, you know where the industry is, you know where the market's going, because you're looking at it from a financial perspective, so you're chasing the big dogs that, are gonna, that everybody's wanting. So we need to leverage that. So everything I can do to leverage that data source to help shape what it is we're trying to do and how we're trying to do it is, is crucial. Okay, that was my last question. So uh, I appreciate your attention. I didn't see but one or two fall asleep. And those that I did see fall asleep, I'll remember. So don't come give me your business card afterward. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but point being is if, if you, Want to jaw jack with me? I'm going to be around this afternoon. I'm, I'll be over yonder. You have to find me. I finally have some business cards with me now, so uh, come see me. I'll be happy to talk to you. Thanks very much.